How's it going, Internet? I'm Tim Stedman, and this is Get Psyched with Tim Stedman. The only show on the Internet where we take a look at why your cell phone battery dying feels like a bigger global crisis than an economic collapse. Enjoy. So today we are taking a look at Science Practice 2, Research Methods and Design. If you end up finding this video useful, please consider subscribing to the channel. It will keep you posted for when I am posting new psych review videos. Which brings me to my second reminder, be sure to follow along with the Get Psyched to Score 5 review guide as you watch each video. The review guide is 100% free and can be downloaded using the link in the description box below. Completing the guide while watching the video will only make it easier for you to remember all the information you need to know to be successful in AP Psychology. Alright, so with that out of the way, it's time to shift gears to the heart of today's topic, Science Practice 2, Research Methods and Design. Every major discovery about the human mind, from understanding how memory works to what triggers anxiety, started with some form of research. It's through well-designed studies and careful analysis of data that psychologists can sort fact from fiction giving us true insights into human behavior. And how do we ensure that our research is producing accurate results? Enter the scientific method. This is just going to be a standardized step-by-step -step process that guides researchers through formulating a hypothesis, conducting research, and analyzing results to draw conclusions. The first step of the scientific method is crafting a hypothesis. This is essentially a prediction or educated guess about what will happen in the study, generally based on a theory. Now, when coming up with our hypothesis, we do have to make sure that it is falsifiable, meaning there must be a possible outcome that can prove it wrong. An example of a non-falsifiable hypothesis might be something along the lines of people work better when they are surrounded by positive energy. Well, at first glance, this seems like it could be a pretty solid question to investigate. However, when we analyze it a bit further, we start to see some of the issues. For starters, the statement is rather vague and subjective. What exactly is positive energy, and how do you measure its presence and its impact on productivity? Since positive energy isn't a quantifiable variable that can be objectively measured, this hypothesis is non-falsifiable and not suitable for scientific testing. But what if we still wanted to research this question? Well, what we could do is frame our hypothesis in a way that clearly outlines observable and measurable outcomes that can either support or refute it. Instead of our original hypothesis, we could have it be something along the lines of employees who work in offices where motivational quotes are displayed report higher job satisfaction scores compared to employees in offices without such quotes. What we did was we replaced the vague variable of positive energy with a more observable variable of motivational quotes. With our newly improved hypothesis, we have the ability to measure a change in job satisfaction scores compared between the office with the motivational quotes and the one without the motivational quotes. Now, once we are happy with our hypothesis, and can ensure it's falsifiable, we can move on to defining our variables. In any type of research, variables are central. These are elements that are measured, controlled, or manipulated in a study. In psychology, our variables can and will include a wide range of psychological concepts, such as stress levels, memory recall, and reaction times. After identifying our variables, we have to define and measure them. This brings us to a key component of any research study, the operational definition. An operational definition specifies exactly how a variable is measured or manipulated within a study. It translates abstract concepts into measurable factors that can be empirically tested. So now that we've identified and defined our variables, it is time to start thinking about how other unexpected factors might influence our results. Confounding variables are those external factors that can interfere with the relationship between the variables we are studying. These confounding variables can mess with our results, making us think that a relationship exists even if this is not the case. When designing a research study, it is crucial for the researchers to identify possible confounding variables as well as attempting to control them. This is so that they don't interfere with our research results. All right, so we've come up with our hypothesis, identified and defined the variables we want to measure, and we have also identified potential confounding variables that could mess with our research. So what next? Well, now it's time for us to measure our experimental variables using qualitative or quantitative measurement instruments. Starting with qualitative measures, these are tools used to collect non-numerical data and provide depth and detail to our understanding of human behavior. A great example of qualitative measures are structured interviews. 
These are carefully designed interviews where each participant is asked the same set of predetermined questions in a specific order. This method allows researchers to gather in-depth personal stories and experiences, providing rich detailed data that might not emerge from other types of measurements. On the other hand, we have quantitative measures which involve numerical data. These measures help us quantify behaviors and attitudes so we can apply statistical analysis and look for patterns. A common tool used with quantitative measures is the Likert scale. These are those questionnaires that give you a statement and you have to say whether you strongly agree or strongly disagree with it. These Likert scales allow researchers to convert subjective information into measurable data, which is very important when it comes to drawing psychological conclusions. Once our research is complete, it can be peer reviewed. A peer review is when other experts in psychology take a good hard look at the study to make sure everything was done right. During a peer review, these experts check various aspects of our research, such as the appropriateness of our hypothesis, our research methodology, the accuracy of the data analysis, and the research conclusions. If the study passes the peer review, it can then be published, which also means it has the opportunity to be replicated. Replication is when other researchers attempt to reproduce the results of the study using the same methods to see if they get the same results. This is an important step in research because it helps confirm that the findings are not just a one-time occurrence and can be reliably observed again under the same conditions. Now, when it comes to research in psychology, methods fall into one of two broad categories experimental research and non-experimental research. Experimental research is going to be when we manipulate variables to try and prove a cause and effect relationship, while non-experimental research examines the casual relationship between variables in a natural setting with no manipulation. So how about we talk about the specifics behind experimental research, and to make it a little easier, we have an example. I want you to pretend that we are conducting an experiment on the relationship between a new sleep medication and how well rested it makes people feel. During psychological research, it is going to be very important to clearly define our variables. In experimental research, this is going to be the independent and dependent variables. First up, we have the independent variables, often abbreviated as IV. This is the variable that researchers manipulate to see if it causes any effect. You can think of it as the cause and a cause and effect relationship. For example, in our research study example, the sleeping pill would be the independent variable. Next up, we have the dependent variable or DV, which are the variables that researchers are hoping to see a change in. It is the effect that occurs as a result of manipulating the independent variable. So continuing on with our example, how well rested participants report feeling would be the dependent variable. Now notice how with this example, we are in control of which participants take the sleeping pill which is our independent variable, and as a result, we are able to measure a change in how well rested these participants are, which is going to be our dependent variable. All right, so after defining our variables, the next step in conducting psychological research involves selecting our participants. So for our example, the population would probably be people with sleeping issues, as those are the type of people who would be taking the sleeping pill. However, studying the entire population is often impractical, Think about it, I can hardly get a group of 30 high schoolers to turn in a single assignment. So imagine how difficult it would be to get information from every single person in the world with sleep issues. So because of this, researchers will often select a sample, which is just going to be a subset of the population that is chosen to actually participate in the study. When a sample is representative, that means that it mirrors the population on all key characteristics. These are gonna be things such as age, gender, and ethnicity. A representative sample helps us avoid biased results and makes our findings much more generalized. Now, one of the best ways to achieve a representative sample is through random sampling, a technique where every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected for the research. This method reduces the risks of sampling bias, something that we will talk about in just a second, and it also helps in achieving a sample that's truly reflective of the population. On the other hand, convenient sampling is a method where participants are selected based on their availability and willingness to take part in the study. Now, while this method is easier and oftentimes quicker, it can lead to something called sampling bias, which is just where certain characteristics are overrepresented or underrepresented, affecting the validity of the study results. All right, so now that we've selected our participants, it's time to talk about how we properly assign them to different groups in our study. Experiments can have both experimental and control groups. The experimental group is the group that receives the treatment or the intervention that we are testing, while the control group does not. 
Having both an experimental and control group allows us to see if the treatment really has any effect by comparing the outcomes between the two groups. Often used with control group members during clinical trials involving things like new medications, a placebo is a substance or treatment that has no physical effect. It is designed to mimic the appearance and administration of the actual drug being tested, which then allows researchers to isolate the psychological effects of receiving treatment from the physical effects of the actual medication. This gives researchers an idea if the results are due to the drug itself or just from the participants' expectations. Random assignment involves randomly placing participants into the experimental or control group. It's pretty much like flipping a coin to decide who goes where, making sure each group is comparable at the start of the experiment. Random assignment is crucial for an experiment to be well conducted. It helps eliminate biases and ensures the groups are comparable, which strengthens the validity of our conclusions. This way, any difference we observe at the end of the study can more confidently be attributed to the effect of the sleeping pill rather than some other variables. And as we dive deeper into completing our experiment, it is crucial to understand how to control confounding variables that could mess with our results. These include biases that may come from the experimenter's setup or from the participants themselves. First up, we have the experimenter bias. This occurs when researchers unconsciously influence the study or its results based on their expectations. If a researcher knows who is in each group, they might unconsciously give more attention to one group over the other. How participants behave can also lead to bias in experimental results. The social desirability bias occurs when participants adjust their behavior or responses to fit what they believe is the socially acceptable answer or action. Essentially, participants respond based on what they think the experimenter wants or what appears favorable to society. To minimize these biases, researchers use blinded study designs. A single blind study is where participants do not know whether they are in the experimental or control group or whether they are receiving the active treatment or a placebo. A double-blind study takes this step further by ensuring neither the participants nor the experimenter knows who is receiving the actual treatment. This method is one of the strongest ways to prevent both experimenter bias and social desirability bias, since it removes any potential influence from both the researchers and participants. With this choice, not only would participants not know whether they are taking the actual medication or a placebo, but also we as experimenters would not know who is part of each group until the experiment actually ends. As you can tell, one of the biggest benefits to experimental research is that it has the ability to establish causality or a cause and effect relationship. By manipulating one variable and controlling the rest, we can directly observe the effects of that variable on an outcome. However, experimental methods also have their limitations. They can be very resource intensive and require strict control of conditions, which isn't always possible or even ethical, especially in real world settings. Additionally, the highly controlled environment of an experiment can sometimes limit the generalizability of the findings to more natural settings. All right, phew. So that just about sums up experimental research methods. Now it's time to talk about some of our non-experimental methods. Yeah, we still got more to go. This video ain't over yet. Oftentimes, ethical constraints and practical limitations make conducting an experiment too difficult or even impossible. So researchers will opt for non-experimental methods. First up, we've got the case study. This research method involves an in-depth examination of a single subject or a small group, providing a whole lot of rich qualitative insights. Case studies are great for detailed explorations, especially in rare or unique situations where large scale experiments aren't possible. However, their detailed nature does mean that they can be time consuming and may not always apply to the general population. And we've got to watch out for potential biases from the researchers themselves. Moving on to correlational studies. These studies look at a relationship between variables to determine how they might relate to one another. But here's the kicker. While they can show a connection between variables, they can't prove one thing directly causes another. And this is where we hit a road bump with the directionality and third variable problems. Suppose a study finds a correlation between the number of hours spent on social media and levels of anxiety in teenagers. The directionality problem makes it unclear whether increased social media use causes higher anxiety or if higher anxiety leads to more social media use. Additionally, the third variable problem could involve another factor, such as underlying stress from academic pressures, which might be driving both increases in social media usage and higher anxiety levels, which would end up misleading the casual interpretation between the original variables. While correlational studies do an excellent job at handling large data sets and offering valuable preliminary insights, remember, correlation does not equal causation. Next up, we have the meta-analysis. Think of it as the heavyweight champion of literature reviews. 
taking results from multiple studies to find common findings. This method gives us more statistical firepower and helps clear up mixed results from different studies. The downside, it's only as good as the studies it analyzes. Poor quality studies can lead to misleading meta-analysis results. Now let's talk about the naturalistic observation. Here, researchers observe subjects in their natural environment without interference. It's great for studying behaviors as they naturally unfold. So imagine you want to study a topic such as bullying in schools. Well, it would be pretty unethical for us to conduct an experiment where we have one kid bully another just to get the results. But what we could do is look for a school where bullying is a problem and conduct a naturalistic observation to get results on our research question. But unfortunately, it's not all roses. The lack of control means we can't always pin down why behaviors happen. And there's always the risk that people might change their behavior if they know that they're being watched. And finally, we hit surveys. Quick, cost-effective, and excellent for gathering data from a boatload of people all at once. Whether it's online or in person, surveys can reach where experiments can't. The pitfalls, we have to watch out for the self-report bias, where people are not always honest with their replies, and we also welcome back the social desirability bias, where people tend to answer in ways that they believe are more socially acceptable. While non-experimental methods have their limitations, they're indispensable in the toolbox of a psychologist. They complement experimental methods and help us paint a fuller picture of human behavior. All right, so hang in there with me, guys, because I promise you we are almost done. Now, it is important to know that psychologists can't go around conducting research all willy-nilly. There are some guidelines that they are expected to follow to ensure safety and fairness. Every study involving human or non-human animals must pass through an institutional review process. This is where an ethics committee reviews the proposed research to ensure it adheres to all ethical guidelines protecting the welfare of participants and respecting their rights. Researchers must also protect participants from any form of harm. This includes both physical and psychological. Health and safety of participants is always a priority. Participants' privacy must be protected as well. It is crucial for researchers to maintain confidentiality or anonymity, making sure no identifying information about participants are published. Sometimes deception is necessary to obtain unbiased results, but it is a tool that must be used judiciously. If deception is used, such as through the use of confederates, it is very important that the participants are made aware of this at the conclusion of the experiment. After the study is finished, you must debrief your participants. This involves explaining the true nature of the study, revealing any deceptions used, and making sure that any misconceptions are corrected. All right, and there we have it, science practice two. And I know I've already said it enough, but I can't stress the importance of these science practices enough. This isn't one and done information, these are things that will continue to pop up throughout the entire course, so make sure that you get the information down. So I will see you all next time for our review of Science Practice 3, Data Interpretation. Peace.